everybody. It's time for Nan and Mandy. Nap time story time. But before I begin, because you know there's been an upsurge in the COVID and the new variant is called Omicron, you must be sure to take every precaution possible. So as I began last year, oh, two years ago now, March, 2020, I began taking my temperature before every reading to ensure that I was in good health and fever free. So let me take my temperature for you now. 97.0, I'm in good health, fever free. Also, please, if you're going out, every time you go out, please wear a mask that covers your entire nose to chin, pinch the nose piece to keep it in place every time you go out. That's a good mask, it's adequate, but this N95 is even better. More layers, adds more protection, so you don't inhale or exhale particles. These fun masks are nice to wear, they're cute, they don't offer much protection, so please, if you want to wear one, Wear one of these, beneath it maybe two of these, and then this on top, and that way you can be festive, look cute, look handsome, look fashionable, but be safe. Okay, now, as you can listen in here, my co-host isn't here, but she left the Grinch and Shrek in her place for today's reading. Many of you are probably home due to that uptick I mentioned, and you might be on remote learning. So this book is geared more towards an older child. The 1619 Project, Born on the Water, written by Nicole Hannah-Jones and Renee Watson, illustrated by Nicholas Smith, is a companion to the adult's big, thick book that I have that is probably over the heads of children. This gives them an idea of what all of those big pages say and makes it more understandable for the youths who are interested in learning about what the 1619 Project is all about. I will read the inside flap to you. When a student receives a family tree assignment in school and can only trace back three generations, grandma gathers the whole family and the student learns that 400 years ago, in 1619, their ancestors were stolen and brought to America by European enslavers. But before that, they had a home, a land, a language. She learns how the people said to be born on the water survived, how they planted dreams and hope, how they learned new words for love, for friend, for family, for joy, for grow, for home. With lyrical verse by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones and Newbery Honor winning author Renee Watson, the striking illustrations by, Nicole, by Nicholas Smith, this powerful picture book from the 1619 Project provides a pathway for readers of all ages to reflect on the origins of American identity by chronicling the consequences of slavery and the history of black resistance in the United States. Born on the Water. These are the dedications for Niger from Nicole Hannah-Jones. For Caleb and Nehemiah, from Renee Watson. To my son Zion, 
May you continue on the path of bravery and brilliance that your ancestors have laid before you. From the illustrator Nicholas Smith. Questions. My teacher gives us an assignment. Who are you? She asks. Trace your roots. Draw a flag that represents your ancestral land. Most of my classmates can count back many generations and learn about the countries where their families came from. They draw their flags, but I leave my paper blank. I do not know where I begin, what my story is. At home, Grandma asks, how was school? I tell her about the assignment, how I couldn't finish it, how it could only count back three generations here in this country, where my parents, my grandparents, and my great-grandparents were born. But before that, I do not know. I tell her that I am ashamed. Grandma gathers the whole family, says, come, let me tell you our beginning. Let me tell you where we're from. What Grandma tells me. They say our people were born on the water, but our people had a home, a place, a land before they were sold. 400 years ago in 1619, our ancestors were taken and brought here on a ship called the White Lion, a whole year before the Mayflower arrived. But before that dreadful voyage, there was a time when they did not pray for freedom. There was a time when they did not sing about overcoming. Their story does not begin with whips and chains. They had a home, a place, a land, a beginning. Their story is our story. Before they were enslaved, they were free. They had a language. They spoke Kumbundu, had their own words for love, for friend, for family. The kingdom of Ndungo was nestled between the Lakala and the Kwanzaa rivers on a high, high plateau in West Central Africa. The people were good with their hands, knew the powers of a seed, how to plant it, water it, how to make something out of nothing. The people were good with their minds, good at math and science. They used shells for money, counting, recording, trading. They knew what their work was worth. They spoke Kumbundu, had their own words for joy, for grow, for home. Their hands had a knowing. Their hands had a knowing. They knew how to hold the baby close, to rock the child, to keep her from crying. Their hands knew how to mix herbs, how to get the just right flavor for a meal. Their hands knew how to beat and twist and shape iron, how to make gardening tools, armor, and weapons. Their hearts had a knowing. They knew how to make work joyful, how to create rhythm by pounding the tools against metal, 
knew how to make music to keep them company as they worked. Their minds had a knowing, worldly, curious, sharp. When they met the white people, they learned quick, taught their tongues to speak Portuguese, taught their eyes to read strange words. They knew how to mix the old with the new. New even and ancient people always had more to learn. And they danced and the people moved their feet, moved their whole bodies to the melody of horns and stringed instruments and marimbas and drums. They danced to celebrate, to mourn. They danced a way of worship to offer thanks. Their bodies a song on the open sky and bright sun. Their bodies a swaying testament to the beauty of creation. Stolen. And the white people took them anyway. Kidnapped them. Baptized them in the name of their God. Stamped them with new names. Ours is no immigration story. They did not get to pack bags stuffed with cherished things, with the doll grandmama had woven from tall grass, with the baby blanket handed down from generation to generation, all the way back, so far back that it carried the scent of the ancestors. They could not hug their fathers and mothers, daughters and sons, hearts thumping in rhythm, clinging to that final sweetness before the pairing, before the parting. No promises whispered from mouth to ear of seeing each other soon. Just wails and sobs, confusion, and wrist-worn roar from shackles made of iron, feet split and bloody from the 200-mile march along the Kwanzaa River. They had no things, but they had their minds. The old ways, the harvest songs, the just right mix of herbs echoed in their memories. They had their bodies, histories and bloodlines and drums pulsing in their veins. With trembling fingers, they braided seeds into their hair, defiantly hiding tiny pieces of home to plant one day in new soils. No matter what some say, the people fought and the white people took them anyway, forced them into the bottom of an evil ship to sail to a new world they had no desire to see. Ours is no immigration story. The White Lion. No one knows how long it took before they knew they would never see Ndungo again. Never run along the high, high plateau or throw their heads back in giggles with their best friends. Maybe it was the second month or the third when they had not seen their land or any land for so many days that they could no longer count. Some could not bear the pain. They refused to eat. They shut their mouths until their hearts gave out. Others tossed themselves into the teal eternity of the Atlantic Ocean, swimming one last time with the ancestors. Sickness and hunger, filth and cruelty took the others, almost half. But those who did not die resolved to live no matter what. 
packed in dark misery, strangers chained together, head to feet, hip to hip, in the bottom of a ship called the White Lion. They saw that these strangers, men, women, children, kidnapped too from many villages, these were their people now. These many people became one people, a new people. And that is why people say, we were born on the water. We come from the people who refused to die. Point Comfort. Finally, the ship stopped moving and the people were dragged to the deck. They closed their eyes against the light of the sun they had not seen since Mother Africa's coast. They closed their eyes against the sight of a land that was not theirs. They cried a silent cry as white men spoke strange words talking about their bodies and with a handshake traded another's child, another's mama and daddy, 20 to 30 beloved human beings and all for a few pounds of food and drink. 400 years ago, in the year 1619, the white people called this land Virginia, a sweet sounding word for a place of such pain. A sweet sounding word for a place where American slavery began. Tobacco fields. From sunup to sundown, the people worked the fields, growing and harvesting tobacco. The crops were sold to Europe, bringing wealth to Virginia, but the enslaved people did not get anything in return for their labor. The people worked and worked. When the people grew weary, they remembered their yesterdays, remembered the songs from Ndungo, sang them to ease their spirits. As they sang, they looked into the future, hoped for better days, planted prayers into the heavens, praying, praying, praying for freedom. How to make a home. After a long day's work planting tobacco in the fields, after brutal, after brutal treatment, after nothing to show for their hard work, sadness was, would come, a longing for Ndungo, for the mamas, for the daddies, for the friends they could no longer hug and talk with under the warm sun. We are in a strange land, they said. But we are here and we will make this home. We have our songs, our recipes, our know-how. We have our joy. We will love, laugh, sing, and hug our children as tight as you can hold a child. We will survive because we have each other. And so, the people planted the seeds they carried over the ocean, snuck to visit one another in the dark of night, sang songs, swapped tales of yesterday, remembering, remembering. And the people planted dreams and hope, willed themselves to keep living, living. And the people learned new words for love, for friend, for family, for joy, for grow, for home. We are in a strange land, they said, but we are here and we will make this home. We have determination, imagination, faith. We will survive because we have each other. The 
the Tuckers of Tidewater, Virginia. 1624, Anthony and Isabella enslaved on the plantation of Captain William Tucker and his wife, Mary Tucker. Two ordinary people forced to till the soil, forced to build a country they were not from, found a way to build a love for each other, to marry and create a family, a legacy. They did not know their family would be the start of a new people. They were just two ordinary people who had a son, a new beginning, a promise to live on and on. William Tucker, hope is a promise. Faith is a better day will come. Belief that things will not always be this way. Hope is refusal to give up, to die out. Hope is a child born. Way back then, Hope had a name, William Tucker. He was born to ordinary people, a man and a woman who were not free, but who believed in freedom, who were not free, but believed that one day freedom would come, even if they never saw it. Two ordinary people gave life to an extraordinary child, a child not of Africa a child not of Europe, nor of the native peoples already here, but a child of the new people formed on the water. The first black child born in the land that would become the United States. The first truly American child. Resist. Life was hard, and it would get harder for the generations to come. White people told the people they were not human, that the people were things to be bought and sold and given as gifts, alongside horses and chairs. When the people were beaten, they said the people did not feel pain. When they sold the people's children, they said the people didn't love. They were lies these people made up so that they could feel okay about slavery. It is wrong always and forever to own human beings. It is wrong always and forever to treat human beings like things. The people fought back. For 250 years, the people resisted every day in ways big and small. For 250 years, the biggest resistance of all was that the people kept living. Yes, we kept living. We are still here. Legacy. And the people who were born on the water survived kept living and living. It was illegal to teach enslaved people how to read, but they birthed generations of teachers and librarians, scholars and authors. They were brokenhearted, beaten and bruised, but they became healers, pastors and activists, doctors and counselors. No one could steal the people's joy. They wrote songs, created jazz and hip hop rhythm and blues. They became inventors and athletes, nurses and cooks, pilots and architects, farmers and housekeepers, singers and artists, dancers and poets, mathematicians and scientists. They passed on their stories through the stitch of a quilt, shared secret messages through songs. The people survived, the people fought, and because the people survived, and because the people fought, they finally got freedom. And because the people survived, and because the people fought, America has equality in the law. And because the people survived, and because the people fought, America began to live up to its promise of democracy. It is the people who fight for this democracy still.
pride. Grandma looks at me and my brother, tells us this is why we say Black Lives Matter, why we celebrate Black Girl Magic, why we believe we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. Never forget, we are their hope. Never forget, you come from a people of great strength, Grandma says. Be proud of our story, your story. The next day, I go to school, pull out my red crayon, my blue, and my white. I draw the stars and I draw the stripes of the flag of the country that my ancestors built, that my grandma and grandpa built, and that I will help build too. And I am not ashamed. I know where my story is, where I am from, where I begin. I would like to thank Nicole Hannah-Jones and Renee Watson for this wonderful story and most especially Nicholas Smith for these illustrations that are most touching to my soul. And I normally at this time tell you to go take your nap, but instead I'm going to tell you to think about it, discuss it, and learn more about who you are and where you are from. And never forget, be proud each and every day. Bye.